you today. We give you praise in this house. Woo! Lord, we love you. Anybody love Jesus this morning? You know, I feel... I never looked at myself as one who could stop a speeding bullet. But now I feel kind of like a superhero or something, man. Give somebody five and you can be seated real quick. Man, I am honored to be here. I know that y'all uh, y'all been having a rough road the last week or two. It's good to have my bride with me this morning. Amen. 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 Come up here. I'm going to pay for this. Hey, is that a brick house or what? Huh? <laughs> Come on. I am going to pay for it. Uh, when I was a little fella, my old daddy used to set trap lines all the time. Anybody in here ever trap? We used to catch coons, bobcats, coyotes, mink, be uh not beaver, uh otter. And uh, we'd set a trap line on Mill Creek one time and I like I said I was a little bitty fella, nine or ten maybe. And uh we hunted year round. I mean, it wasn't the only season we knew was salt and pepper, right? <laughs> and uh we were setting this trap line on Mill Creek and a coon, you know, a, a smart coon will turn a trap over and he'll eat your bait and get out and you won't trap him. So we come to a spot in a bend on the creek and this coon had turned his trap over. And uh, all of a sudden my dad heard some, some dogs running a deer and he had his 30-30 with him. He said, you stay here, fix this trap. He said, I'm going to run to the river and head those dogs. He said, I'm going to shoot that deer if I can get to the river before he does. So, and he looks at me and he says, just follow the creek and I'll be waiting for you at the river. So, man, he takes off running and I, I fix the trap and I get it all just like it needs to be. Get the, get the plastic over it and get the sand on it, put the bait out. Well, I stand up and I take this duffel bag full of traps and bait and all kind of stuff and I put it on my shoulder and I start following the creek towards the river. Well, man, there was a bend, and I went around the bend, and then it was a briar patch, and, and then it was thick, and I could hear those dogs in that direction. And I said, you know what? It makes sense to me just to follow the sound of the dogs. Because, hey, that's where my dad's going to be, right? He's going to be heading the dogs off. But that ain't what he told me. He said, follow the creek, I'll meet you at the river. So I head towards the dogs, and I keep going towards the dogs, and it gets later, and later, and later, and all of a sudden, I realize I don't hear the dogs anymore, and I'm out, I'm in the Sabine River bottom swamp, and I am very, very lost. All day long, I wagged around in those woods, and I walked out after dark on the highway down on Maryville Highway. It's a very long ways from my house. Somebody picked me up and said, son, everybody's looking for you. <laughs> and all I could think about was, son, I got a serious whooping coming, right? <laughs> so he takes me all the way back to where we lived. We get out of the man, the law's there, the, the game wardens are there, and cars I don't even know and my mama comes outside and she looks at me and she hugs me and then she reaches and she starts <laughs> slapping you ever been there you're so excited to see somebody but you just want to hit them in the face <laughs> so we had to go down and shoot the gun my dad come out and I'll never forget what he said he looked at me he said why didn't you just do what I said right. see how many times have we got a good, clear word from the Lord? He'd say, just do what I said. I will meet you at the river. I will be there when you get there. Just follow the creek. But we begin to walk this thing called life, and all of a sudden, I begin to think, you know what? My way, the way I see it, the way it sounds to me, I might do better 
Not to do it his way, but to do it my way. Just for a little while. But see, when you go to listen to the hounds of hell, and they off running over there, they're going to leave you high and dry every time. We have to stay focused. Because the enemy comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And he wants to distract you so that we will never find the river. So that we'll never find that place where God said, I'm waiting on you. Amen. Amen. You got your Bibles this morning. I titled this message this morning, Riding the Wreckage. Riding the Wreckage. If you will, turn with me to Acts chapter 27. We're going to start reading in verse 39. Why don't you stand with me? It's just, we just honor the Lord as we read His Word this morning. I love you, Pastor. Words cannot describe the relationship that we have. And if I had to stop another bullet for somebody, I promise you it would be Him. I just hope I can do it in a superhero way. It says, when it was day, they did not recognize the land, but they observed a bay with a beach on which they planned to run the ship if possible. And they let go the anchors and left themselves in the sea. Meanwhile, left them in the sea. Meanwhile, losing their rudder ropes, and they hoisted the mainsail to the wind and made for shore. But striking a place where two seas met, they ran the ship aground, and, and the prow struck and remained immovable. But the stern was being broken up by the violence of the wind. And the soldier's plan was to kill the prisoner, lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion, wanting to save Paul, kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim should jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest, some on board, some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. Lord, I thank you for your word. It's alive and it's active and it's sharper than a two-edged sword. I thank you, Lord God, that when we come into contact with your word, we're forever changed. I thank you today, Lord God, it's by your Holy Ghost that you would just pierce our hearts, our minds. Lord, let our ears be open to hear what you say to this church here today. Lord God, anoint me that I could bring your word, Lord, so that it would be clear, so that it would be concise. Lord God, so that you could do what you do in our lives. We love you. We give you praise today in Jesus' mighty name. Somebody said amen. amen. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to be here this morning. I am excited to be here, give you a little background on what was going on with Paul. They had, they had took this journey. They began to sail out, and from the beginning, the ship was in trouble. And uh, Paul told him, he said, everybody's got to stay with the ship or nobody's going to make it. And uh, so one thing after another begins to happen. They go days and days without eating. They finally, the sailors sense that land is getting close. And uh, they, they just, they, they're just wanting to make it. You ever just want to make it? We find ourselves in situations where we, it's hard to breathe, man. We can't even look straight. And, and our mind is going crazy. And it's like a, clothes, like a tennis shoe in the clothes dryer. You ever hear it? Ka-clump, ka-clump, ka-clump. And it just seems like that's all we do all the time. Ka-clump, ka-clump. In Acts 27, in verse 29, it says, Then fearing lest we should run aground on the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern, and they prayed for day to come. Now, you see, anytime I preach, I can't just preach one message. I have to preach like three messages. So y'all bear with me this morning. These four anchors they dropped, I believe that these are anchors that we could say, you know what, these are things that happen to us when, when things are going bad, because I can tell you in this world, things are going to go bad. Amen. You know, it, it's, it's, uh, we, could, we could say, man, as long as you do this, everything will always be fine. Everything's not always going to be fine. I got a feeling everything's going to be all right, but everything's not always going to be fine but as i heard pastor jerry say one time i'll be fine i'll be fine no matter what so they began to throw these anchors out because the ship was heading towards this island and they were feared they were going to run aground so 
I want to show you four things about four anchors this morning. The first thing that we do when we see that life is getting bad, we see that things are happening, things are out of our control, we, don't, we can't manage the situation, we're, 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 we're not sure what's going to happen, there's certain, there's certain anchors that we begin to throw out to try to slow the progress of the calamity. Hello? Are we here? The first one is we become furious. I got to blame somebody. It's got to be somebody's fault. It's, it's somebody's fault that, that my house has flooded again. It's somebody's fault that that cancer came back again. It's somebody's fault that my kids are acting the way they're acting again. And we get so angry. We, we have to have somebody to blame. And when we can't find anybody else to blame, we'll blame God. Amen. You know what insurance companies call it when something bad happens with the weather? It's an act of God. It ain't my fault. It's God's fault. Do you remember when Lazarus died and Mary and Martha? They, Jesus, man, he, he'd been dead for, for three or four days, and, and Jesus finally comes. And what is the first thing that Martha says to Jesus? Jesus, if you would have been here, he wouldn't have died. The people around her said, hey, it's Jesus. He opened blind eyes and healed the sick. If he'd have been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. Mary runs out. Jesus, if you would have been here. Jesus' response was, I am the resurrection and I am the life. Though he might, may die, he will live again. He's basically saying, you know what? I know all things and I've got all things covered. And you're blaming me right now because you just don't really understand. See, and there's certain things that we're not going to understand. I couldn't understand why my daddy wanted me to follow that creek when I could have just went towards the dogs. But we begin to feel furious because this is happening to me. The next anchor we tend to drop is the anchor of fear. Fear. Man, I dropped that anchor down because I'm afraid. And I don't know what's coming exactly. And I, 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 just, I just don't want to face it. I don't want to look at it. Can I tell you something? If you don't deal with your issues, your issues will deal with you. If you do not deal with your issues, your issues are going to deal with you. One way or another. Jesus said, I say to you, don't worry about your life. What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, about your body, what you're going to wear. He said, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He says, look at the birds of the air. For they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his statue? What do we worry about? We worry about what if it's going to happen again. See, and when we begin to worry about what if it happens again, what are we going to do if it happens again? Oh, no, it might happen again. We begin to live our lives based on what if instead of what is. What is? Jesus is. Don't be afraid. Don't let fear run your life because when we begin to let fear run our life, we begin to do something I like to call reacting. See, most of us in our life, we react to situations, but we never pre-act before situations. 90% of our life is based upon what happens to us. The other 10% is on what we choose to happen. When it ought to be the other way around. We have to learn to be proactive. We have to learn to say, you know what? I've made up my mind that I'm going to be a success no matter what happens. I've made up my mind that I'm going to walk the walk no matter who likes it or not. I've made up my mind that I'm going to be a man of God come hell or high water. 
I've made up my mind that I'm going to be faithful to my church. I'm going to be faithful to my pastor. I'm going to be faithful in my giving. No matter what happens, I have made up my mind not to react, but to act. Not based upon fear, but based upon the fact that Jesus loves me and he died for me. The next thing is fatigue. We're furious. We have fear. And then we're just burnt out, man. We're fatigued. See, I know that when Harvey came through, y'all had to, had to start all over, some of you. And then all of a sudden, here comes I'm Melba. Mel- Mel- what is it? Imelda. And now here you are, you're having to just kind of like start all over again. But let me tell you something. According to the word, we can't grow weary in doing good. We cannot stop. We cannot quit. We cannot back up. We cannot look back. We have to press on for the prize. And I I say it like this. I'm either up or I'm getting up. Say that with me. I'm either up or I'm getting up. Let's say it again. I'm either up or I'm getting up. I refuse to stay down. I refuse to stay down. We're either up or we're getting up. You have furious fear, fatigue. And then there's this whole finalization deal. Finalization? Yeah. Do you remember the story in Acts chapter 3 where... where, uh, Peter and John, they went to the temple and they went to the gate beautiful and there was this man who had been sitting there begging at the gate for all his life. He was, he was lame in his legs. And I can only imagine this man had been sitting there all these years, sitting at the gate beautiful at the temple. You got, he, he would sit there with his little jug and he would shake it when people would walk by. He would see, see people walk into the temple crying. And then he'd see them come out praising God. He'd see people going in there sick. And he'd see them walk out healed. And he had probably made up in his mind, sitting there begging at that gate, you know what? My situation is final. I will never get to go into the temple. I will never pass through the gate beautiful. I will always sit here. I will always be a beggar. I will always be a loser. I will always have to depend on everybody else. I will never accomplish anything in my life. All those things that my daddy said about me, how useless you are, how trashy you are, how you'll never make it. I begin to believe those things. My daddy used to tell me, son, I wish I'd have killed you when you was a kid. That way I could have got, oh, I could have got away with it. It's like, wow, Dad, I love you too, right? <laughs> but see, he can, I can only imagine he felt like my situation is final. There, there's, there's nowhere for me to go from here. I, this is as good as it's ever going to get. You ever feel like your situation is as good as it's ever going to get? I have. I thought, I'll never get past this. I'll never get over this. We went through a series of things in our life where uh, after Hurricane Rita, I was helping rebuild somebody's house and I broke my back. I had to have surgery. By the time I got over that, I was bush hogging at the church. The the bank caved off. I rolled the tractor over on myself. By the time I got over that, I went hunting with some guys and they shot me with a loaded double R. I still think you had something to do with that. (laughs) Where was I at? (laughs) Finalization. I got shot. About the time I was about to get over that, I had a wreck and I hit a bridge. Broke my hips, my fingers, my shoulder. And I come to the place where, hey, I was fierce. God, where you at? I was fearful. What's going to happen next? I began to feel like 
you know, I, I, I begin to feel like, man, this is about as good as it's ever going to get. I just don't see no light at the end of the tunnel. So just like this man that sat at the gate, he said a certain man lame from his mother's womb. He was carried to the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful, to ask for alms from those who entered the temple. Here's this guy that life had dealt him a blow. It wasn't his fault. It wasn't nobody else's fault. He just found out that his life, that he was lame in his life. Can I tell you something that all of us have in common with this man sitting at the gate? It's a lot easier when life knocks us down. To look at everybody else going in and coming out and thinking, how come they're so blessed and I'm not? How come everything happens to me and I know how they live? I know how they live. I know what they watch on TV. But they're making it good. So what happens, just like this man who was lame, who was set at the gate beautiful, he was right at the edge of the temple. He could hear the worship going on. He could hear the preaching going on. He could see people coming and going, their lives being changed every day. And we, we as as believers, life hits us licks, knocks us down, and we find ourselves sitting at the gate beautiful, and because we're lame, Because we've been beat up, because we've been broken, we find ourselves lame. And we become lame in our prayer life. We become lame in our walk. We become lame in our attendance to church. We become lame in our giving. We become lame. And we never enter into the temple. We never enter into the place where God can truly change our lives. Because we're lame in everything that we do. Are we good? Y'all ain't throwing nothing yet, so. I'm standing up here where I can get behind this pulpit if I need to. But we find ourselves lame. And then all of a sudden, somebody comes along. And says, you know what? Silver and gold I don't have. But in the name of Jesus, get out of your lameness. Get out of your, get out of your chair. Get out of your place of, of fatigue, your place of fear, your place of finality, your place of being angry with everybody and everything because life hasn't treated you right. It's time to get up and say, I'm going to the gate beautiful. I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm going to see my life changed. I'm going to help somebody else get their life changed. Preach it, I am. Woo! Y'all ain't going to help me, I'll help myself. Because I'm either up or I'm getting up. I'm either up or I'm getting up. Woo, Lord, thank you, Jesus. Now then, all that was not even my message. Are y'all ready? See, there's two kinds of people when it comes to crisis. There's two kinds of folks. Let's read Acts again. And the soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners lest any of them should swim away and escape. But the centurion wanted to save Paul. He kept them from their purpose and commanded that those who could swim jump overboard first and get to land, and the rest, some on board, some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. There's two kinds of people here. First, you got strong swimmers. you got strong swimmers. It does not matter what the circumstance or the situation, how it looks. They always seem to know what to do. They're always out front. Pastor Jerry's a strong swimmer. I, I called him the other day. I was, I was telling the worship team in there. I called him and I, 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 when I heard about the church and his house and you guys getting flooded again. And, and I called and I was feeling all pitiful. And, and I, I called to, so he and I could cry together. That didn't work. I said, Pastor, I'm so sorry. 
Well, I'm sorry to hear about your house again. I'm sorry to hear about your church flooding again. He said, Kenus. I said, what? He said, ain't nothing but a little bit of time, money, and hard work ain't fixed. <laughs> you don't want to cry? A little bit of time, money, and hard work, babe. That's what he said. That's all it's going to take to get us back on track. See, because Pastor Jerry's a strong swimmer. My old daddy had a stud horse one time named Cucklebur. It's a long story. Yeah, you take a Cucklebur and put it under the blanket on the horse. You get on him and, yeah, whoo, it's rodeo. Anyway, old Cucklebur was a strong swimmer, man. I'd ride down to that river, that river where we lived a good 150 yards wide. You could take old Cucklebur and lead him down on the sand or walk him down on the sandbar, and he'd just wade on off in that river with you, and we'd swim to the Texas side. I Many a time I slipped off back that side on got a hold of his tail, and I would start going to the bank. I'd slide back up on, and uh, I'd ride over and I'd kill y'all's deer on the Texas side. <laughs> But I never could get him to jump off of a bluff. And that was the fun stuff, man. And, and I'd try to get him. There was a bluff up on Red Banks Creek about a mile above the house. And, and it, was about, it was probably a 20-foot bluff. And I'd walk over Cucklebur up there, and I would try to spur him over, and he just wasn't going to jump. Well, it didn't make no sense to me. I wanted to jump. That old road led around there. It was and, and right before you would get to that bluff, it made a sharp turn. It was about 10 foot, and then it was straight down. So I got a plan one day. I said, I'm just going to run him. So I got him running down that road. Broom, 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 broom. We come around that turn, and he saw that, and he started digging. And at the last minute, he just spread out. Man, down we went. Whoosh. Man, he come up, and I come up. And he had water come out of his nose. It went 40 foot over there. Man, just sprayed everywhere. And we swam to the other side. Do you know after that, if you'd get a bluff on, around a bluff on him, whether you wanted to jump or not, you was going, babe. <laughs> and I cannot tell you how many times my daddy would leave on that horse and I'd be thinking, Lord, please don't get near a bluff bank. <laughs> He's going to jump over there with daddy. <laughs> but he would do the coolest thing. You'd rock him up to a bluff and he'd always stop. And he'd turn and look at me. <laughs> and then he'd look straight ahead. And off we'd go. Sometimes. Somebody has to tell us. You're going to have to jump. You're going to have to swim. Sometimes people will have to push us and say, you know what? It's going to be all right. We're going to make it. We're going to jump. We're going to swim. We're going to go. But see, then you've got other kinds of people. you got the strong swimmers. Those who jump first. Those who get to the land first. Those who seem like they get everything first. And then you have people that have to ride the wreckage. Remember what he said? And the rest, some on board, some on parts of the ship. And so it was that they all escaped safely to land. You had strong swimmers, man. They jumped out into the bank. They went in room. You got to remember the ship's being torn all to pieces. It's panic. It's chaos. You got people swimming. And then you got those of us. And I've been a wreckage clinger in my life a few more than once. You just got to hang on to whatever you can hang on to to make it. You just have to reach back and you have to say, Lord, if I don't have something to hang on to, I'm not going to make it. So he tells them, get a hold of the ship, get a hold of the boards, get a hold of whatever you can find. You know, Joseph was a perfect example of a man that rode the wreckage. Remember, his brother sold him into slavery. Then he ended up in prison. 
There were times when he could have said, Lord, I give up. Lord, I quit. I'm tired. I'm burnt out. I'm afraid of what's coming next. And Lord, I'm angry with you because I've been faithful and you let me go through this. But he didn't. And I'm coming in for a landing here pretty quick. In Philippians 4, 8, Paul basically says, if there's anything good, if there's anything praiseworthy, man, if there's anything, anything you can see and find that has God in it, he said, meditate on these things, dwell on these things. So what is the wreckage that I cling to? What are the things, what are the things that, that, that I cling to? I cling to my Jesus. He is my Lord and He is my Savior. In His name every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. I cling to the, to the hope that I have in Him. I cling to the hope that says one day, one day, He's going to meet me at the river. One day, because I'm going to walk the walk, even though it's hard, even though it's tough, even though it don't make sense to me at times, even though it seems like, God, you have lost your mind. I'm going to keep on walking, and I'm going to keep putting one foot in front of the other, and I'm not going to stay down. I'm going to keep getting up, and directly, I'm going to come to that river. I'm going to come to that river, and he's going to say to me, well done, thy good and thy faithful servant. What are some other things I can cling to? I can cling to, I can cling to things like I got a pastor that loves Jesus, and he loves Jesus so much that he even loves me. I got a pastor that won't give up, that won't quit. And let me tell you something about your pastor. He's not here, so I'm going to get in his business. Your pastor suffers with his feet. But you know what? He don't sit at the gate and feel sorry for himself. Uh-uh. No, sir. He's going into the temple every day. He's making intercession on behalf of you. He is praying to Jesus to, to bring us to a new and exciting place. Pastor Jerry, if you're watching this, I love you. You have to hang on. My brother set it up here a while ago. Man, we got some strong swimmers in this church. You hang on to knowing that, you know what, if I'm in a bind, I can call on, to my, I can call on my brothers and my sisters at Little Country Church and something will happen. You can hang on to the fact that, that we have fellowship, that we love each other. You know what? Strong folks, strong pastors, strong fellowship. Can I tell you why the devil hates you so much? I was about 15 or 16, and me and my old daddy couldn't see eye to eye anymore, and I ended up leaving home, and I got a job fixing flats at a tractor place. I'd go to school in the mornings, and I'd go fix flats in the evening. And uh, there was this old man come up there, and he had some kind of tire in the back of his truck, and I was looking at it, a little big tractor tire, and... I was telling him, yeah, I, I can do this and that. He said, where are you from, son? I said, I grew up in a little town called Evans. He said, I know where that's at. He said, you know where that Gene blunt from out there? I said, yes, sir. I said, Slick's my grandpa. I said, and Doc's my uncle. And this old man got this look on his face like pure hate. Just, just the blood left his face. He just drained out and he just looked at me. He said, we got into it with that Gene Bunch one time. He said, my brothers and I, he said, we was at a shindig. He said, we decided to leave because we knew their reputation. He said, they followed us down the road and run us off in the ditch. And he said, before it was over with, he said, they held my little brother down. They cut his heel strings. And he never walked again. I'm just looking at him, you know, because he hated me. He hated me. 
because, because that was my grandpa and my uncle. He hated me. And he closed the tailgate, and he said, you won't ever touch anything that belongs to me. And he got in his truck, and he drove off. You know why he hated me? Because I reminded him of somebody. You know why the devil hates you? Because you remind him of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You remind him that soon and very soon we are going to see the king and there ain't nothing he can do about it. You remind him. You remind him that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You might have to ride the wreckage. You might have to get a hold of the pieces. You might have to struggle sometimes. But just like, just like what happened to Paul and everybody else on that ship, as long as we stick together, as long as we're all believers in Jesus, we all going to make it. Stand with me this morning. Oh, Lord Jesus, we love you. We give you praise. And I got a feeling that everything's going to be all right. I've got a feeling that everything's going to be all right. Oh, I've got a feeling that everything's going to be all right. I thank you today, Lord Jesus, that you live inside of us. That no weapon is formed against us is going to prosper. Lord, that when the enemy rushes in like a flood, that you're going to raise up a standard against him. I thank you today, Lord, that even though some of us may be riding the wreckage, we're hanging on. We're wondering why. Where was you? I'm tired. I'm burnt out. I can't go through this again, Lord. And we begin to think, is this as good as it's ever going to get? If you're in this place this morning and you've been riding the wreckage, raise up your hands. I want to pray with you. I've been riding the wreckage. I've been riding the wreckage. I've been riding the wreckage. If that's you this morning, raise your hands. Thank you. Thank you. Come on. Come on. Raise your hands if that's you. God's going to do something incredible for you this morning. I, I feel it in my bones. I feel it in my spirit that God wants to touch you. Lord, you see these hands all over this place. Lord, you know every heart. You know everything that's going on. Lord, some of us are just hanging on. We're hanging on to, to, to failed relationships. We're hanging on to, to, to failed jobs. We're hanging on to, to bitter things, Lord. And we're dropping our anchors. We're dropping things, Lord. We're holding on, hoping that these things that have happened to us in the past will never happen again. So, Lord, we, we, choose, to, we choose to give up. We choose not to fight. We choose to stop. Don't you quit. If you're in here this morning and you're riding the wreckage, don't you quit. Don't you back up. Don't you stop. Don't you turn around. You keep putting one foot in front of the other. And every time that the enemy rushes in at you, you remind him, Devil, I know where you're going. And the only reason you hate me is because I remind you of the Jesus that lives inside of me. So, Lord, today I pray for peace that passes all understanding. Lord, everyone that raised their hand this morning, Lord God, I pray that you would just pour upon them warm waves of love, Lord, that they would have peace like they've never known. Lord, that they would begin to see clearly, that they would begin to understand that you have a plan, that they have a purpose. And if they'll just keep following the creek, one day you're going to meet them at that river. You're going to meet them at the river. Lord, I pray this morning that you would give us all the ability and the strength to be strong swimmers. Lord, we would realize we're not down. We're not staying down. We're not defeated. We're not beaten. Because we're either up or we're getting up. Lord, I'm going to deal with my issues before they deal with me. We love you. Let's just take a minute. Let's just let the Lord move in here. Let's just raise our hands. Let's just let the Lord move. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Touch us, Lord. Lord, let your Holy Ghost just burn a spiritual. Lord, just, just, just through every wall that would try to hinder, Lord. Through every mountain, Lord God, let your Holy Ghost just move. Shake us, Lord God. Wake us up, oh God. 
let us realize, Lord Jesus, if you live in our hearts, we all going to make it. Thank you, Jesus. walking and he saw a fig tree he said he saw it from afar off and it looked like it was good for fruit and when he went to the tree there was no figs on it and he cursed that tree and I wondered about that for a long time and the disciples even said Lord it's not the season for figs And the Lord showed this to me. That no matter what season we're in. No matter if we're having a hard time. No matter if we're, we're fighting doubts. No matter what season we're in. He still expects fruit. He still expects fruit. So be fruitful. Listen to you, Pastor. Make the little country church the strongest church as it's ever been or ever going to be. Just, just press in and keep on. Don't you quit. Because God has a plan and a purpose. Amen. Amen. I love you, little country church. Grateful for that word. At this time, I'd like to have our uh, our guys come up. If you guys need to tithe an offering envelope, go ahead and lift up your hands. We have some announcements. September 29th, TLCC Kids Noah's Ark Mission Trip. Today, we are going to try and help our kids go on this trip. Listen, I've seen all the pies and the cakes and every other assortment of goodies back there. Uh, listen, if you don't want them, buy one for me, okay? <laughs> Uh, they, <laughs> I'm, I'm helping one car, and they got like eight things from one car. I, I know there's enough back there. Let's support our kids. This is, this is how they're going to be able to go. This is how they're going to be able to go without stress, without, uh, we're going to be able to do this. We want them to enjoy this to the fullest. How are they going to do that? Your guys' support. Uh, September 29th. Uh, no dinner on the ground today. Uh, we're going to reschedule this for later. We, uh, the uh, swap had originally intended to have dinner on the grounds today. <laughs> grounds are a little rough right now. So uh, we're going we gonna to reschedule. Uh, Canton trip is still on. If you are not going, or if you are not going, be sure to call and cancel your hotel reservations. I don't see Miss Marie here, but uh, uh, if... If you're not going, they say cancel the reservations, but you can still go up. You can go up for the day, hang out. If you ride a bike, I know uh, Zion's Lions, you guys are going to still ride? No, j Bo's not. I know Pastor is. Robert's going to be leaving. Okay, Robert's going to be leaving. Leaving North Campus at 9 o'clock. There you go. Leaving North Campus at 9 o'clock, uh, and that will be on Saturday? Thursday. Thursday. Oh, okay. Good. Original plan. Uh, just like original. There you go. Um, October 6th, Lady Sparks would like uh, all ladies from the north and the south, let's join our lift. Meeting after service next Sunday in the Fellowship Hall. See Miss Diane Phelan. There she is. If you guys would like to be a part of this, this is just the ladies' ministry. It, it blesses the ladies. See Miss Diane after service. Um, 
Yeah, let's get ready for the fall conference. It's coming up. Um, we always say it. Look, the reason this church is a success is because of you guys. Without you guys, it doesn't mean nothing. So let's show up. Let's this thing be a success. Uh, they are going to be smoking meat. Um, they are going to be cooking. Uh, I believe we're going to have the North Campus. The chapel should be ready by the time conference comes. So we're gonna we're gonna praying, hoping. Um, if you guys want to help, we're there every day. Come help. We'll have food, huh? Yeah, it's several Mondays. We 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 had pastor last time. He said, look, we're going six days a week. This time he was like, pump the brakes. Let's be smart. Let's not wear ourselves out. Let's be wise in this, and uh, which is great. Um, not only for me and my family, but uh, for everybody, because we realize there's life that has to happen outside of the church. And so uh, we got to keep on with that. Uh, but this conference will be success because you guys show up. Not only because you show up, but because what you take from that conference, you apply to your life. That's what makes a conference successful, is that you learn something, that you applied something to your life, and it made you more like Christ. So we're excited for this. Today, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commissions, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom.